So welcome to week two of Onward, where we're spending seven weeks figuring out how to together move more towards what God wants us to be as a church, figuring out how to engage the culture without losing the gospel. Last week was on kingdom, and that's why this frame is here, because what we talked about last week is that the kingdom frames everything for Christians, not just the gospel and the mission, which you could see as maybe the frame, but everything in creation and culture. Everything that's part of human life. The kingdom doesn't just frame what you might call our religious life. Our, our religious, religious life frames all of life because the kingdom frames the gospel, which frames the mission, which is how we're meant to bring renewal to creation and culture. And so the second week, as we, given that framing, is embodied over here with the fact that how do we actually engage the culture, all the area in which we live, all the things swirling around us, with the kingdom. Um, I want to make sure that we don't start by misunderstanding. So let me just run through the logic of this really fast again. If the kingdom frames everything, then the kingdom is going to create in us a gospel identity or kingdom identity, right? Around King Jesus. And if we have a kingdom identity and we actually live it out together, then what we're going to have in the midst of us is a kingdom culture, right? And that culture in the perspective of the culture of the world, is going to look strange. Now, that leads to a very straightforward question. How, how do you engage a culture that thinks you're strange? Now, before we go further, I want to make sure that you don't miss the, miss the message because you just don't understand the definition of a Christian word. So let me just—these are three key ideas in, in the message today. So um, I just want you to make sure you're clear on them. One, kingdom is just—when I say kingdom, I just mean the rule of God through his providence revealed in Christ the King and that will ultimately be fully realized in heaven, okay? That is, the kingdom is just that God is king and he rules and um, that rule is right and frames everything, okay? The second is culture. And culture—all I mean by culture in this context is just what we humans lay over what is there in creation. So creation it just is— we humans enter into it, and we do things. We believe things. We take actions. We make institutions. We produce things. We do all kinds of stuff. And all that stuff we do is culture. And culture is always a mixture. And it's a mixture of God's common grace. It's a mixture of what comes out of the divine nature in us, whether we are Christians or not. We all have God's image, and we all act partially out of that in our humanity. And it's also affected by sin in the flesh our denial of God and not wanting to submit to who he is and what he said or to acknowledge the reality of his kingdom. And so culture is always a mixture, which is why the Bible has a, a word, world, worldly, or worldliness, which is essentially the collective expression of sin in human culture through the flesh and sin. It is creation and culture captured, twisted, and narrowed by our sin. So in culture, part of what's going to capture narrow and twist, the way it's expressed through our humanity is how the flesh affects it, affects it collectively, and affects it over time. And so when the Bible talks about the world, worldliness, or being worldly, in most contexts that is not referring to nature and creation. It's referring to how we as humans create a God-denying culture in which the kingdom has to come in and renew within— and those two things, worldliness and the kingdom, end up clashing within the realm of humanity or culture. And so what the kingdom has to do is engage culture, and in doing so, it engages the worldliness. Let me give you a story about how this works. Um, a few weeks ago, I got um, a text message that um, kind of— it was actually really encouraging for me. And it came out of a situation where a few people in the church had kind of gotten— um, had related to each other in an unhelpful way, and it had created a lot of hurt feelings. And I went and talked to the two main— antagonists in the story, and listened to them as they both told me what had happened. And then, um, then a miracle happened. And here's the miracle. Both of them individually and separately said to me, not, what are you going to do to that person? You know, how are you going to change the church so that I don't leave? They, here's what they both said. What do you think God would want me to do? At which point I could say, well, I think you should go talk to them. And I think that there was a failure of love on your part in this way. And I think that you should apologize for that. And I think you should try to share just as plainly as possible how what they did, how you felt about it. And then a second miracle happened, which is they both did it. 
<laughs> they sought each other out, and it was, they apologized to each other, and they talked about how these actions, they both learned something. They learned something about the gospel. They learned something about themselves. They learned something about Jesus. And for a moment, they created an increased beauty for the glory of God within the little culture of the kingdom, culture in High Point Church. Okay. And then one of them sent me this text message because I think the person realized that every time I intervene as a pastor when people are not getting along, I'm, I'm a little bit tilting my head back to get my throat slit by them. Like they know I'm always kind of getting in there and, and there's an opportunity that I, I become the bad guy somehow and everybody's venom can get loosed on me, which is true and happens relatively frequently. But she, she wrote and said, what in the world was it that got hold of you at such a young age to know Jesus as your living hope? Right? Which is great because it, it both— focused on what God was doing in my life, and so my moment of self-righteousness was subverted by her saying, what has God done in your life that you would be like this? And as I thought about it, I said, you know what really got a hold of me? It was a camp. It was a, it was a summer camp where I saw Christians make a whole different humanity together in this one little place. And when I went to school throughout the year, it was this, you know, the Hobbesian state of nature, pride, fear, anger, acceptance, power, control, comfort. It was all that swirling around. And, and then I would go to this place, and there was a new humanity where I wasn't attacked. I wasn't put down. People were calling something great out of me. Everybody was pointing us to Jesus. It was, had this kind of richness, and it was, it was strange. It was no kidding. It was a bunch of charismatic Mennonites. It was strange. But, but it was, it was beautiful. And it's like the first time you realize that girls might not have cooties. You know, that's that, where you're, you're like, wait a second here. For guys. Hopefully the guys can connect with that one. Um, it, was, it, was, it was beautiful in a, in a different way, and it was in a way that even though I realized that if I gave myself to it, I was going to be strange to the rest of the world the rest of my life. It was that beautiful that it drew me in to seek whether or not it was true. And when I realized that it was true, I believed. And I've been strange ever since. Um, so you could lay out what this is about this way. If the kingdom creates a culture, and that culture is strange to the world, how do we engage a culture that thinks we're weird? And Jesus gives a very straightforward answer to this, and it's not we win by war or corporate takeover or even by infiltration. Participation, but not infiltration. He, his, very, his very simple answer is, is that he is going to create a different community, a counter community, to be a kingdom culture called the church. And the church can only be that together. It can only be that when it really comes together in a local church. And only when it does that can it create an example in a, the real existence of a kingdom culture in a specific place that somebody could come in and be affected by. Because, listen, I was told about Jesus by a number of people before I ever went to that camp. And I was told that Jesus died for my sins and that God didn't weigh my sins on a scale like I had thought from my Roman Catholic upbringing, which is not what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, but it's what I got from it. And and I, so a number of people told me that, but I didn't see the beauty and was not led by that beauty to its truth until I experienced the counter community of the kingdom, which embodied and expressed the gospel in a way beautiful enough to capture my imagination and to move me towards its truth. Most people will not come to the gospel merely by individual witness until that individual witness is actually demonstrated in the beauty of the culture of the kingdom, and that is seen in contrast to the worldliness of the world. And it is only in that reality that many people will see that there is something fundamentally beautiful and different, a different kind of way to be human, a different kind of culture in which they will then f find in faith the bravery to be thought strange for the rest of their life so that they could possess and be part of and belong to the beauty of the gospel. And so we as the church, those who believe in Jesus and belong to each other in Christ, we exist to embody and express the culture of the kingdom and the cultures of the world. Okay, that's as simple as you could say it. As, well, as simple as I could say it. That we, the church, exist to embody and express the culture of the kingdom and the cultures of the world. Now, in order to do that, there's two ways that we have to embrace our identity. Two ways we have to be ourselves. 
One is we have to be ourselves by embodying and expressing the kingdom culture within the church. We actually have to become the kingdom culture together. We have to actually become godly and like Jesus so that we really are an expression of the kingdom culture. That's, that's one thing. And then secondly, we have to be ourselves in embracing the strangeness of the kingdom among the cultures of the world. Okay, we have to become a real expression of the kingdom, and we've got to embrace the strangeness as we go out into the cultures of the world. So let's look at the first one. The first is, is that we have to be ourselves by embodying and expressing the kingdom culture within the church, right? It's one thing to say that the church is going to affect worldliness, but what if worldliness is what we are? What if the church is worldly? Then there's no contrast. We're not strange at all. There's no relief. There's no difference that can be perceived. There's no beauty, right? And so Peter starts this epistle by focusing on what Jesus has made the people of the church together, right? He says, don't, okay, don't you guys see what you are together, right? He later talks about how everybody's like a, a spiritual living stone that is being built into one temple. And it's the temple as a whole that expresses the beauty to everybody seeing, right? But he says, you together, that's a plural you. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God so that you could declare that is express, right? You could declare him who called you out of darkness and it was wonderful light. So that's what you are. And then he goes back and rehearses the story. So you remember where you're from because that's also deeply motivating, right? He says, don't, don't you remember? Once you weren't a people. Once you didn't have each other. Now for some of you, you'd be like, oh, I remember those days. Those were easy. No, no. You have a brother and sisterhood. You have a divine family that you belong to in Jesus, if you belong to Jesus. Everybody here is your brother and your sister. We all belong to each other in the most profound spiritual sense. And you, there was a time you didn't have that. Apart from Christ, you don't have that. And in and through Christ, you do have that. There was a time when you were not the object of mercy. You had not received mercy. You were an object of wrath, the book of Ephesians says. And, and that's what you were. And then you became, at the moment of repentance and faith, when, you, when Jesus drew you and you came to him, you became the recipient of God's mercy. And that's what you are now. You're a recipient of God's mercy. Everybody in here who's a believer, who belongs to that family, and that royal priesthood is, is an object of mercy. Right? And he says, dear friends, because of that, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, right, this has made you strange, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Do you see how both embodying and expressing are both in that passage? He says, you are this so that you could declare— you could declare the glory of God to all people, express. And then he says, since you didn't belong and now you do belong to Christ, what's the second application? That you would, you'd flee the evil desires of the flesh, which war against your soul. Why? So that you would live such good lives among the pagans. That is, you would embody the kingdom so beautifully. And then you'd express it so freely that the result would be that though they attack you, because whenever you, whenever you do this, Whenever you, with someone who isn't, it always feels like a personal attack at first, at least. But they might get over that if there's enough beauty. So that either in short time they would come to believe and glorify God on the day he visits us, or if they ultimately don't in final judgment, they will recognize. Which means, here's the good news. The good news is, is that what we're doing and being a church that wants to move onward, a church that engages the culture without losing the gospel, that it's, we're not doing another thing. It, like, you might be like, oh, I'm going to go to church, and the pastor's going to be like, you got to do more stuff. Actually, what I'm saying is, is that there's not one tiny momentary thing, not one more thing that you have to do in addition to trusting and believing in Jesus, embracing the truth and power of the grace of the gospel that will transform you to be like Jesus. All you have to do is just become like Jesus in all his godliness, truth, and righteousness. That's it. Through faith. So it's, it's not another thing, but it's a serious thing. Right? Um, there's a—in in 1 Corinthians, there's this church in the city of Corinth where Paul is— talking to them, and he, 
And he knows that they can have such an impact on their city. It was this trading city. It was very wealthy. There's all these ships, cultures coming in and out. Had enormous potential. But the problem was, is that the Corinthian church looked just like Corinth. The dudes were going to, to prostitutes, and there's a guy shacking up with his mother-in-law, or I'm sorry, his stepmom. And like, they were doing, I mean, they were doing all kinds of stuff that looked nothing like Jesus. And so he writes to them in chapter 3, and he says, I'm going to start right here. He says, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. See that phrase? Worldly is not a reference to creation, but the opposite of spiritual in this context. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? You see, his, his issue is he said, listen, when I was with you last, I was not talking about mature spiritual truths. I mean, I was basically saying in Christ, use your words, right? And I, I think you may think that you had gotten quite a long way in the Spirit in that. And he's like, that's it's not actually true. There is, there is a great distance of maturity that, that you can grow into and that you can experience. And, and when that happens, you don't act like mere men anymore. Stuff that is normal on Monday, which is normal Monday at the office, isn't true among you. Like, for example, the examples he uses isn't murder and isn't even going to prostitutes. It's, yeah, you guys like are quarreling all the time. You're just arguing with each other. And since you're arguing and you're jealous of each other, isn't it obvious that you're just acting like unredeemed, unregenerate, unsaved people who don't know Jesus, who aren't touched by the Spirit in any meaningful sense, and are not living for the kingdom or even are aware of the kingdom? Do you want to stay babies sucking out of bottles? Do you want to be just like the city around you? Or do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to let the kingdom frame who you are? And do you want to embody and express the culture of the kingdom and the culture of the world? It's the same call but it's clear that as long as we are worldly, we can't lovingly frame the kingdom for the world. We can't embody and express something that we aren't, we're not becoming. Now, um, Moore makes this point in the book where he, where he says he was a youth pastor in Mobile, and he said, you know, there were these church kids that came to the youth group, and then there were these other kids from like South Mobile that were like burgeoning gang members who'd never been to church and didn't even know how to play church, and they were in the same youth group, and some of the church kids and even their parents said, hey, I'm not sure these people should be a youth group because, don't you know, the Bible says that bad company corrupts good morals, which is in the Bible. And so maybe these kids shouldn't be hanging out with these good church kids. And of course, Moore said that what they didn't know is I knew that their church students were smoking up, drinking, having sex with who they wanted, and then playing church on Sunday. He said worldliness wasn't from South Mobile coming with these new gang members. Worldliness was upstairs in their kids' bedroom, right? Which, this, here's what I didn't like about that section of the book. I didn't think he went far enough. Because— why do you think worldliness was up in the kids' bedrooms? Do you think it was all godliness downstairs? Because I doubt it. I, I think here's what happens. In, in, in early life, we are drawn to living out life fully, as fully as we know how, in worldliness, through intoxication. And that intoxication can come from romance— and that intoxication can come from sports heroics, and that intoxication can come from substances of various kinds. But we believe that we need to express ourselves, we need to experience things, and we need to enjoy the intoxications of life, and all their aesthetics, and all their fun, and all their enjoyment. And that that's real living, right? The problem is, is that when we get older, we realize that people who behave like that end up poor artists, living in bad apartments without health insurance. Sometimes they end up with records and things like that, you know? Whether, whether it's going to jail or LPs, it's about as bad, right? And so they think what you got to do is you got to play by the rules and get an education and learn how to get a good job and dress the part and learn how to talk to people. And if you want to destroy somebody, you don't yell at them. You like ingratiate yourself with the boss and then drop little hints about how they're not a good—whatever. And you learn how to get ahead and you learn how to access the greater worldly pleasures of maturity like power, success, money— security. And you see, when we then turn around to our kids, and we have a thin veneer of Christian religion, which is really just to uphold our practices of worldliness that we want them to follow in our footsteps so that they can have all the worldly things we've achieved for themselves, why wouldn't they say, 
I don't, I don't darn well feel like chasing your kind of worldliness right now. I'm perfectly happy with chasing some intoxications. And so our protective self-righteous moralism that we can easily religiously veneer, where we're incredibly worldly, just in a more mature, less self-destructive sense, and then we turn our children and we go, you should be like me and be godly. And they're like, forget you. You're not even happy. Is it any wonder that worldliness would be in our kids' bedrooms? It's in our bedrooms. It's in our briefcases. My kids know I love my hunting trips, and I love my guns, and I love my free time, and I love to play. I love all the things that make me feel comforted and secure. As I was writing this, I actually asked my oldest daughter, I was like, I was like, baby, do you b really believe by the way I act that the most important thing to me is you and your being, your faith and your godliness, and everything else is a quadrillionth second to those things, right? And she looked at me, she, and she said, she said, oh, daddy, just every day, right? But I still, I still felt like I had to ask her, because I wasn't sure, because I feel like, hey, those things are in order. Let's get on to these other things. Like, let me teach you how to be a success. But it's, it's very often that when I teach her how to be a success, I am not bringing those practices back to the gospel and showing how education is meant to serve Jesus, as it serves the world, and then as it produces an income and living. I, I don't always do that. I just go, hey, you got to do your social studies. You got to do your math. Education's important. Well, why is it more important than weed? Unless I can connect it to how it is living out the image of God and thinking God's thoughts after him. And so ordering ourselves for the life of the world and intoxicating ourselves with the ever-expanding glories of the beauty of God himself, which makes pale all the aesthetic intoxications that we would chase wrongly and recognizing that within that beauty, God gives us creation to enjoy in all its proper and ordinate intoxications that we're meant to enjoy. He created those things. If we really want to deal with worldliness, it's not going to do to just say, hey, don't be promiscuous, or don't be racist, or believe in this political ideology, and then you're a good person, or we have to actually go to Jesus and attend to him, recognizing that unrighteousness and unleashed self-righteousness, whether it's a destructive worldliness or a protective worldliness, it's all worldliness. Legalism is just as much worldliness as licentiousness. Neither is acceptable, and neither embodies Jesus. And we have to, we have to seek a third thing, that is— a life and character and faith that is framed by the kingdom and the life, death, and resurrection of King Jesus in this thing called the gospel, his good news. So what are some convictions and applications to take from this? One is we have to just become ourselves. We have to believe the gospel. We have to be Christians. We have to recognize that we're meant to be the people and the culture of the kingdom. We need to recognize that we're a holy people, and we're a royal priesthood, and we're a people that belong to God. And we used to not be objects of mercy, but we were objects of wrath. But now we've become objects of God's divine mercy, and that should transform how we see everything and want to experience everything. And faith and trust in the gospel should motivate and center and frame everything about us. Because we're meant to be a kingdom people. The second is our, wit our witness is as much in kingdom culture as in personal evangelism. It is true that all of us need to exude and express Jesus by actually speaking the gospel to other people wherever we're sent to. You might be the only person that knows Jesus in your circle of influence. And if you don't exude Jesus in both expression and embodiment, people may not know or hear the gospel at all. But oftentimes, too, it's not until they come into a community of the gospel and can see it that they actually experience its beauty and are led to its truth. And if, if we don't embody it, oftentimes there's nowhere where people can experience the reality of the gospel. 
All they're left with is, is philosophy and history and those sorts of things. And until they experience the regeneration of the gospel, there's no experience of it. But yet when they come among us, they should experience it. They should experience love like they've never experienced. They should experience interest and hospitality like they've never experienced it. They should experience generosity like they've never experienced it. They should experience unity, a refusal to speak bad about others, a desire to speak encouragingly and to call great things out of each other. They should experience their, that like they've never experienced it anywhere. I remember I was in Florida one time, um, and I was driving around with a realtor, and he was a mystical, semi-irreligious Jewish person who went to an evangelical church in Fort Lauderdale every week with his stepfamily. And I was like, why? <laughs> and he said, you know the world we live in. It's the only place in the entire culture where you can go and people care about each other and they invest in each other and they love each other and they're positive towards each other for a whole hour. I was like, dang. He— he, he, didn't, he didn't believe in Jesus at all. <laughs> but he took his family every week to the church because he was experiencing the kingdom. He just didn't know it. It'd be great if there were a lot of people here like that. Third is, we have to be vigilant about selective worldliness. What normally happens when you do come to Jesus, right? There's no chance anymore for your flesh or devils to be like, you don't want to believe in Jesus at all. Once you're in, you're in. So the best thing that, they, that can be done to keep you as ineffectual as possible is that you would think worldliness or godliness is all one set of things, right? So you're a crusade student and you learn that like sharing your faith is a really big part of godliness. And so you share your faith a lot and like you think you're a great godly kingdom living person because you're living in that lane, Right? Or you can be part of another church where everything's about poverty and like connecting to the poor and doing all that kind of stuff, and nobody ever talks about whether or not you should be sleeping around, right? There's lots of different— the kingdom frames everything. Who we sleep with and how we talk to people and what kind of work we do and how we deal with our leisure and what— how hard is working hard and what do— covenantal friendships look like, and what should a marriage look like, and how do we raise children, how do you drive, and everything is framed by the gospel. And it's really easy to get narrowed down on this little thing. And if you do that, what happens is you make excuses for everything else, and worldliness just fills up like an unflushing toilet in those areas, and it's not beautiful among the people of the kingdom. And most churches have very strong blind spots in a number of lanes of the kingdom. And it's, that's one of the reasons why churches should actively seek to be intergenerational, multi-ethnic, and international. Because cultures are sinful and godly in different ways. And when you interact with another culture, the things that they have come out of their humanity, their, their, the image of God in them, to value, your culture might not. And, but your culture might value something else. And then when these two Christians ram into each other— these people go, wait, whoa, 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 you value that thing, which is in the Bible. It's totally, yep, but you don't value this thing. What? Why is that? You, so, so for example, you have the white church that really values taking care of yourself. You should bear your own weight and have something extra so you can help bear the weight of others when they're in need. Self-reliance. That is right out of Galatians chapter 6. It's perfectly biblical. It's really important. Everybody should work hard to have all that they need and to have some to share with others. 1 Timothy chapter 4 or 5, right? And yet, there's a ton in the Bible about like, if somebody wants your coat, rip your shirt in half and give that to them too. Even if you're then without what you need. Right? If your enemy asks for money, if somebody asks you to lend them money, give it to them and do not expect them to pay you back. Right? Well, is that only when you have enough mark? I mean like, and there are other cultures that are going to come in and say, wait, whoa, 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 that's not how we think about this at all. Or we tend to think, American, American Christians, especially white middle-class Christians, we think that our life doesn't affect anybody else, and so nobody can say that our behavior is affecting them. Our, our behavior affects everybody. And there are other cultures that know that very well. There are other cultures, for example, that think honoring your parents is actually a really important biblical commandment because it's a big part of their culture. Is it a big part of our culture? Doesn't seem like it to me. And yet they understand the gospel better in that area. And so when, you know, a Korean Christian comes in and watches us behave towards our children and children towards their parents, they're like, what do you guys think you're doing? <laughs> this is crazy, right? 
And so one of the things that helps us not engage in selective worldliness is our own vigilance and trying to read the Bible with fresh eyes every day, but it is also being intergenerational, intercultural, and international, and reading books written by dead people who are removed enough from us that they can talk out of a different culture and correct our modern narrow thinking. And then just lastly to reiterate, there is no shortcut to this. Jesus' plan for the world is that we, the church, would embody the kingdom in a way sufficiently beautiful as to profoundly engage the culture of the world by embodying it and expressing the gospel in the kingdom. Okay. The second is that we have to be ourselves by embracing the strangeness of the kingdom in the outside, in the culture, in the outside of the church. Outside of the church sorry. Um, Jesus said, that there were specific things about the church that could not be changed. And those things would highlight what the church is and make it different and therefore strange and weird in relationship to the culture of the world. And that was intentional. It can't be changed and it can't be adjusted, right? When he says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying there isn't anything else playing that role. Only you can be the salt of the earth and you're only worth anything to the world if you're the salt. If you give up that role and you say, well, we'll just be like them, that you are nothing. Right? You are the salt of the earth and you have to be the salt. Right? When he says, you're a city on a hill, you can't be hidden. You can't be like, hey, we're the city on a hill, but shut down the lights. We don't want people looking up here. You, you can't. You're a city on a hill. You can't be hidden. People are going to look to that city to see what cities might be like. When he says you're a lamp that's lifted up, it's not hidden under a bush, but it's lifted up so that it brings light. You, you're the light of the world. You can't not be the light of the world. If the, if the world says, hey, it's too bright, you can't turn down the lumens. It doesn't work that way. You see, one of the things that we have to recognize is that we have to— um, and when we engage the world, we, we're not— Jesus didn't just ask us to bear— the fact that the gospel will make us strange. We're not just supposed to endure the fact that the kingdom is odd to the world. Jesus told us to believe that we are blessed and that we should rejoice and dance because of what we bear, because of the strangeness of the kingdom. Look at what he says in Luke 6, 22, 20, 23. He says, blessed are you and men— Okay, let's count this. There's five things here. Blessed are you when what? Men hate you when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil. Okay, that's only four. But reject you and they count your name as evil. They destroy your reputation. Right? You're out. And, and what does he say our response to that should be? He says when that happens, you're, you're blessed. If and only if it's what? Because of the Son of Man. If you're just a jerk, then you don't—you're not blessed, okay? Right? Only if it's because of the kingdom, because of the name of the Son of Man, Jesus, the King. And if you, li if you live out the kingdom and people hate you and exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of him— that you're blessed. And he says, and he gets even more specific. This is the response. He says, in that day, you should rejoice and you should leap for joy. Right? You should leap, you should dance in happiness. That's pretty happy. I'd be pretty happy to dance. I'm not a big dancer. He says, because great is your reward in heaven, because you're living for the kingdom. Because, so where do you expect your reward to be? It's going to be in the kingdom. And he said, and, and it's because they're treating you just like they treated the people who lived for the kingdom before you, the prophets. Right? In Acts, this happens, right? John and Peter are preaching the gospel, and it is not publicly acceptable either to the Romans or the Jewish sect that was in control at the time. And so they're dragged in and they're whipped publicly. And then this is what it says. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Now, note there, it doesn't say they rejoiced because they were counted worthy to be whipped for the name. He, Luke intentionally, through the Spirit, adds in a clear emphasis on the humiliation. It's not just that they were whipped. 
It's that they were publicly whipped in front of everybody with a specific intention to destroy their name and credibility in the face of all people. It is the personal name and character assassination involved in whipping them publicly, the disgrace and humiliation which led to their rejoicing. And then when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the church in the New Testament that we know of the most direct and active persecution, everybody was beating up on them so much so that Paul had to run so that he and everybody related to him wouldn't be killed. And he writes back to them in one of his letters and he says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. This is evidence that God's judgment is right and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. See what he's saying? He's like, all through Israel and Judea and Samaria and Turkey and Greece and Italy, everywhere we go, we talk about you guys because of how beaten up and attacked and humiliated you, you are and how you bear it with this beautiful perseverance and that you rejoice in your sufferings and you are always strong in every step along the way. And it shows that what God has always said about rejoicing and suffering is true, and that your faith is real, and that you are participating in the kingdom. And so you see, the, the, the claim in the Bible is not just that we should be able to get over the fact that the world will count as strange, or that we should be able to somehow um, like ratchet up enough strength to feel kind of strong enough to endure it. That's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says that if we see Jesus as the king who bore every indignity to bring truth and reconciliation and to inaugurate the kingdom into this world, and if he called us after him to expand his invitation through gracious mercy to all the peoples of the world who would believe to come into his kingdom and to en would enjoy the beauty and the eternal glory and happiness of that kingdom, and that we would suffer the exact same indignities as him that were the result to a people who understood the king that they served and followed, they would rejoice that they would be able to walk the same path as Jesus. That they would rejoice that they, they would know in their being dealt with as strange aliens in the world that they would know that they were on the right track. That if because they believed the gospel, some believed and some hated their guts for it, they would know that that was actually a good sign. And that in their suffering, that they could actually count it as a spiritual compliment that God was counting them worthy in faith to suffer for his name. And that that was an extraordinary privilege that they could bear. One of the things that we have to realize is that the reason why we don't want to be counted strange actually isn't because we're afraid if we're strange, we won't engage the culture. The reason we're afraid of being thought strange and weird is because we want to be accepted by the culture. Um, if we're strange, we won't be accepted and approved of by the culture. But there's nothing about strangeness that makes us unengaging. Right? Chester said said one time, um, a thing may be too sad to be believed, or too wicked to be believed, or too good to be believed, but it cannot be too absurd to be believed on this planet of frogs and elephants, of crocodiles and cuttlefish. Now, obviously, nothing can literally be too sad or good or wicked to be believed. Those aren't reasons to believe something are true or false. But it's, what he's saying is, is it's even worse to think that because something is strange, it's unbelievable. The world is full of strangeness, and some of the strangest things in the world are the most engaging. The fact is, is that we don't see the world as strange as it is because we've become accustomed to much of its strangeness and don't pay any attention to it anymore. That there should be men and women. That they should be so strangely different. That trees should grow. That there's such a thing as an elephant or a squid. And yet for some reason we think the kingdom is strange. We have no idea what normal is. And the strangeness of the kingdom is the heavenly normal. And the normal we're actually inviting people to. And if you want to be engaging with the world, you have to be weird and strange in the right way for the name of the Son of Man. 
But if you want to be accepted, you'll never be able to embrace the strangeness of the gospel. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians. He said, thanks to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God an aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. To one we are the smell of death, the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? You see what he's saying? He's saying all we do is we walk with Jesus. We just walk with Jesus and we seek to be to God the fragrance of Christ. So we try to live our lives in such a way in embodiment and expression so that the smell coming off of us is Jesus. So that God would smell it and be happy. That's what we're doing. That's all we're doing. We live our lives to spiritually smell like Jesus so that it would be an offering of worship to God so that God would inhale and enjoy. And yet, in embodying and expressing it, the fragrance of Jesus goes out to all people. And to some people, they smell it and they say, that's beautiful. I love it. I want to be part of it. How can I, how can I be part of that kingdom? And they come to Jesus and they're being saved. And then other people, they smell it and what they smell is a rotting corpse. And it's horrific. And they want to get away from it as fast as they possibly can. And what, what Paul is saying, he says, who's, who's equal to such a task? Who, who's, who's good enough for this? Other than by faith and by just being as we can like Jesus, who could possibly grapple with that this is all we are and we can't control how anybody will respond to us? All we can be is the fragrance of Christ. And some people will think it's the most charming and engaging strange they've ever smelled. And some people will think it is the most horrific and distasteful stench that they've ever perceived. And we have to embrace that. Moore says in the book, don't you see that the, the culture doesn't want something that's almost like them? There's nothing engaging about people who claim to be Christians, who try to be as worldly as possible, and then sort of lather Jesus over the top of it and say, oh, don't you want to be a Christian? The fastest shrinking churches in America are the ones that are entirely secular, entirely political, and like Jesus. People just go, well, I'll just be secular and political. I don't see why we need religion on this. I'll play golf and go fishing on Sunday morning. Thank you very much. It's strangely enough, it is the churches that are the strangest to the world. The ones that say, yeah, I believe that the man Jesus literally died and rose from the dead, was himself the God-man who died for our sins and ascended into heaven, and is bringing his kingdom in through the church, this strange group of people among all nations, tribes, and tongues. People— We'll look at that and we'll be like, that is insane. And yet, strangely enough, that is the gospel people come to. The strange one. The crunchy one. So what are some convictions and actions about this? One is, we just flat have to have the conviction to embrace the strange. Keep Christianity strange. It's supposed to be strange to the world. It, we're not living in the kingdom if we're not strange to the world. You have to embrace it. You have to realize the world as a whole is not about to approve of us. They never did. The culture never wanted the whole gospel, even when it liked a veneer of formalized Christianity in the past. And it's never going to in the future. And the kingdom of God, Jesus, Jesus always spoke of it as a minority report. And it, never in your lifetime will Christianity in the full gospel of the kingdom be utterly embraced in the culture around us. You are always going to be disapproved of. And yet, the, in the gospel, that can be a fountain of joy, knowing that you get to walk the same path as the Savior. And in the words of Philippians chapter 3, becoming like his and so somehow— to attain the resurrection from the dead. The second is, is that we need to recognize there is no virtue in non-kingdom weirdness, okay? I know I've seen Christians sort of, they're Christians and people don't approve of them because they're Christians and they get more unnecessarily weird to like embrace the strangeness and there is no, there's no godliness in that. 
okay? Like, we could all say that we were all going to wear, like, flannel, flannel overalls, like, for the rest of our lives to, like, really show how different we are, and that, and straw hats or something, and there's no, there wouldn't be nothing good in that. Um, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, right, I become all things to all people so I can save as many as possible. That is, in all the things in culture that are indifferent or are expressions of God's grace, we actually should conform so that we can move towards our neighbors in all the ways we can. Does that make sense? There's nothing godly in being like, well, I believe in Jesus, so I'm just going to hate the Packers. Well, I mean, if you're from Chicago, fine. But like, there, there's, no point in, there's no point in being against the things in the culture that are indifferent. In fact, we should conform as much as possible to come close to our neighbors in all the ways we can. There's no virtue in weirdness. The only strangeness that produces glory is the strangeness of the gospel. In all other ways, we should learn from conformist cultures. The third is, that the kingdom fits into real life. I know that you'll feel like, well then, what do we just like make a, like a commune somewhere? Like if we're that different? No, because in every culture, the grace of God and the image of God, our humanity, even under the flesh, is, is going to ins- express something in the image of God, and there's going to be good in every culture. There are going to be things that we as Christians can move towards and help them flower and renew and live through them for the good of all people in the city. And so we can always engage with our culture, even though we can't engage with everything in our culture. Right? There's no Christian way to be a stripper, but there are Christian ways to be politicians and lawyers and doctors. And maids. Right? Fourth, one of the things that you'll find is is that every society that recognizes that they're a minority that wants to hold their cultural distinctiveness has minority practices. So I have a Jewish father-in-law. I was part of the gay and lesbian student movement when I was in my undergrad days, just because they were my neighbors and they were the most people, the people that I seen most different from me. So I joined the group. And then the third was I toured with a gospel choir and I was one of two white people in the whole group of gospel choirs that toured. And so I've been around Jewish people when I was the only non-Jew. I've been around gay people when I was the only not gay person. Apparently, I look pretty gay. And, the, and thirdly, I, I, I was often one of the only white people around black people having a good time, and they did not mistake me for being black. And so <laughs> what you'll find when you're around any of these subgroups, when they're with themselves and not with the majority culture, there are practices that they have to affirm and foster their identity so they can go out into the world and be considered strange and live proud of what they consider their identity, right? And so if you're, uh, if you're with African Americans or if you're with gay people and they don't think anybody else, they will call themselves stuff that you can't call them. Stuff that would be considered very offensive, but it's actually part of a normal minority action where people call each other the names that the rest of the world calls them to sort of like, ratchet themselves up and prepare themselves to hear it and to, and to bear it together and then laugh about it, to sort of disarm its strength and all these kinds of things. Jewish kids, like, they're supposed to do bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs where they learn to read Hebrew and they get connected to their Jewish heritage in that language, right? They don't make them eat falafel, but that's a good part of it, right? And there's all these kind of minority actions. And listen, once you realize that the church is no, major- no cultural majority and we never will be, we never have been, you begin to realize that all of the practices that Jesus instituted are for a minority people to know who they are and to become themselves strong enough together so that they can be themselves out in a world that is a contra-majority. This is the reason why we come and we worship Jesus together. It's why we pray together. It's why we read the Bible together. It's why we have growth classes. It's why we come up at the end of the service and pray with each other. It's why we have small groups where we learn and talk about the gospel and applying it together. All of these practices, are, they're not revenue generators for the church. They're not so we can hire more stuff. They exist so that as the minority people of the kingdom, we can get as connected with our kingdom identity as possible. So as we live together and as we disperse into a majority culture, we can be ourselves. We know who we are. We're rooted in who we are. And so when we casually come to church every once in a while, we don't get involved in small groups or Bible studies or anything like that. We don't particularly pay attention when people preach or the preachers we don't like preach. 
We don't realize the very nature of how Jesus has constructed the kingdom to be a, be a minority people that live for the redemption of a majority world. And lastly, um, we need to recognize that our practice of engaging the culture includes both connection and contradiction. Oftentimes, there, there's been so much work in evangelical churches about to, to, to be as unoffensive as possible, to not say things that hurt people's feelings, to be more co politically correct in how we talk, to have services that seem to resemble things like that, you know, to, you know, not to wear suits or anything like that, and religious whatevers. And some of that stuff I think is good contextualization. I think it's, I think you want, there's ways we can be like the culture and in different ways, and we don't seem unnecessarily different. I think all that's fine. But, um, everyone in the Bible who preaches the gospel and lives the gospel contradicts the majority culture. So Jesus in Nazareth, he's like, this is what the gospel of the kingdom is. People are like, this is so great. And he's like, no, you don't understand. It's being fulfilled right now in me. And they're like, we don't like that. Paul goes to Athens, and he, he's on Mars Hill. He's like, I see that you guys are really religious and really philosophical, and you've done a lot of really great thinking, and that is super awesome. However, you are completely ignorant of the true God, and the thing that you find most unbelievable in your philosophy, that is somebody could be bodily raised from the dead, is the basis of the entire religion of the kingdom of the one true God. To where it says people started laughing at it. Right? Augustine, the fifth century, Rome falls— the political powers that be at Rome go, hey, let's blame the Christians. You know, it's the Christians that didn't support our country, and that's why this country fell apart. And Cousins like, dude, it was not the Christians. Thousand pages, he writes. Now, he was like them. He studied in Rome. He was a Latin rhetorician. He was one of the most learned men of his age. He was, he was, he was incredible. And yet, what he said was, no, what destroyed your culture is you worshiped gods that were worse than you. When you glorify in all your plays— and in all your gladiatorial games, where you treat life as cheap, and you worship gods who rape each other, and strangle each other, and kill each other, and your culture then acts like them, and then disintegrates, and then you want to blame us? I don't think so. And he wrote a thousand-page defense called The City of God. Right? He was as like as possible, but he recognized that the message of the kingdom contradicts and the same is true of us in Madison. There's a lot of things to affirm about Madison culture. There's a lot of great monuments that we have built. There are a lot of institutions that we've created for the greater good and for the good of all people. And yet many of those institutions are possessed by the flesh and misused by sinful intentions and therefore do not produce the goods we hoped they would. And they are not actually in keeping with what human beings are meant to be. And at some point, in many ways, we have to move as close as we can and participate in the ways we can. But the gospel of the kingdom contradicts the world. And we have to live recognizing that in that strangeness, we have to both connect with and contradict. And not just with just Jesus. I know some people are like, listen, don't fight about anything that isn't Jesus. You know, honestly, the church has actually never found revival that way. In almost every moment in the history of the church where there's been great revival and cultural transformation, the church has actually fought on something else, usually cultural or political, which brought Jesus into the question in which the gospel was then preached. In the early centuries, it was disease and infanticide and that men were allowed to sodomize their wives and they didn't particularly like that. And the church preached against slavery and the, the slavery, sexual use of females, and the killing of children, and so on. And it turned out that slaves and women's, slaves and women were like, yeah! And it became this big political upheaval in the Greco-Roman world, and thousands of people came to faith in Jesus. And it's really always been like that. And our silence on things like abortion, or racism, or urban decay, or or kids growing up in poverty, or any of these sorts of things that we're not supposed to talk about because it'll sound too political, because then we blah, 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 blah. I don't really think we can play that game. I actually think that we're going to have to live out the kingdom through the church and do what we believe is right and engage the culture where it's possible, and that is meant to make Jesus the issue in which we'll have to then be able to coherently talk about Jesus and the kingdom and what we were meant to be as human beings and hope that there can be some transformation in the culture, and that people in that culture will be drawn to believe the gospel, to participate in the kingdom. Now, let me just end with this. What that means is, is that if we're meant to embody and express the 
culture of the kingdom and the cultures of the world. It means that what Jesus has actually made is he's made a test by which we can only do what we're meant to do if we will be who we were meant to be. One of the most beautiful things about Jesus is that he has created a utterly gameless system. Have you ever noticed that? There really isn't any way to game the gospel or God. He responds to faith and sincerity. He, if you will give it up and quit playing games, he will draw you into everything. But there's no way to game it. We can't be a successful church without being godly. It's impossible. He set up the whole system so that we would be the kingdom together, so that we would witness a kingdom beauty together, so that people would believe the gospel when they share it, experience it among us, and come in. What that means is we can't ever be cool church, or good church, or strong church, or big church, or successful church without being godly church. It's impossible. We can build a short-term phantasm, but we can't build a multiple generational beauty. Jesus has made the test of the kingdom, the test in the hearts of our unbelieving neighbors, the beauty of our kingdom life together. He has made the beauty of the culture of our local church the first major step of persuasion by which people would really look to see if this distasteful thing called Christianity might be the truth and press in further to question whether or not it might be true. But people are drawn first by beauty. And so if we want to become a culture that, a, 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 a people that engage the culture, there's no shortcut. There's only beauty. And that beauty only comes in the strangeness of truly becoming a kingdom people. Seeking actual righteousness and godliness by faith that is neither unrighteousness nor self-righteousness. To have, to, to not be content with the milk of spiritual infancy, but want to go on to all the maturity in seeing all the successive glories that there are in Christ. To not allow for ourselves to be godly in one little narrow thing selectively, but not in others, because it's comfortable for us. And to not be only willing to be around people like us so that we can be affirmed in our narrow godliness. But if we'll submit ourselves to really becoming people of the kingdom, when everything is framed by the gospel— in all of creation and culture, we will become a people who in the kingdom culture are beautiful enough to attract those in the worldly culture in which we live. And they will believe when we do. They will believe as soon as we do. As soon as we embrace the message of the kingdom for ourselves, and then embraced its strangeness among our neighbors. Let's pray. Father, we, um, we recognize that the gospel is actually not that complicated. Um, that there's more to be said about our stubbornness than its complication. And we pray that now as we take a minute to think about your, your goodness and your invitation and what you've done for us in the cross, that you would connect it with our, our understanding of what it means to be in a people of the kingdom together, a culture of the kingdom in the local church. And I, I pray that it would be enormously transformative for us in what we do. Help us to believe the gospel and to become a people of the culture of the kingdom so that in embracing its strangeness in the world, our neighbors could believe and become part of a royal priesthood and a people belonging to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.